those who are joining us online, uh, welcome to the Mansfield Foundation's program on U.S.-Japan cooperation and cybersecurity. My name is Frank Chinuzzi. I'm president of the Mansfield Foundation, and it's a great uh, pleasure uh, to welcome you here on a sunny Friday afternoon in Washington, D.C. It's a busy week in U.S.-Japan relations. Prime Minister Kishida uh, will be giving an address uh, at Johns Hopkins uh, Fresh Hour Center just down the street in, in about an hour, a couple of hours. Um, and one of the topics that I suspect he will address is the, the new dimension, the new domains of U.S.-Japan cooperation uh, in the context of the U.S.-Japan alliance, uh, both in space and in cyber. Uh, the Mansfield Foundation uh, is an independent uh, operating foundation. We were created by an act of Congress uh, 40 years ago in 1983 to honor Maureen and Mike Mansfield. They normally have their portraits here, but they're, they're removed for space considerations this afternoon. Uh, Maureen and Mike Mansfield were great public servants. Uh, Senator Mansfield served as the longest serving Senate Majority Leader in history, also the longest serving US ambassador anywhere uh, in history, 11 years uh, in Tokyo. Uh, and our foundation's mission is simply to promote cooperation and mutual understanding between the US and our partners in East Asia. And uh, we try to do that in fields and on issues that matter, uh, issues of consequence uh, to the future of uh, global peace and security. And, and one of those that has emerged in recent years uh, and is becoming uh, really mission critical uh, is in the area of cybersecurity. So we're delighted this afternoon to be joined by three experts on cyber issues, cybersecurity, and on US-Japan relations. Uh, all three of them have contributed to a Mansfield Foundation project sponsored uh, by the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo uh, to examine the issue of uh, how the U.S. and Japan can ensure adequate uh, uh, human capital in the field of cybersecurity. And we will address that topic uh, uh, partially this afternoon. Um, uh, you're... Uh, invitation to this event included the bios of our three speakers. I will just uh, highlight a couple of points. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Bartlett uh, is assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Miami University. He always likes to remind people that's Miami University in <laughs> Ohio, not in Florida. So he's, he's not threatened by uh, 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 climate change inundation um, at the University of, of, of Miami in Ohio. Um, and he's an expert on, on computer science and, and cybersecurity issues, and he teaches about cybersecurity policy. Uh, Mihoko Matsubara uh, is a good friend of the foundation, and, and is, I think, arguably, uh, uh, the top uh, cybersecurity uh, thought leader in Tokyo. Uh, she works at NTT, where she's the chief cybersecurity strategist. NTT is a leading international company in the field of cybersecurity and a major provider of cybersecurity services to the Japanese government, as well as to Japanese companies. Um, and Ms. Matsubara earned her master's degree down the street at Johns Hopkins University sites uh, under a Fulbright program, um, and has written extensively and, and worked extensively in the field of cybersecurity policy, including workforce development, but also cybersecurity policies that can help make us more secure and ensure the resiliency uh, of our economies in the face of emerging cybersecurity threats. Uh, finally, Simone Petrella um, is the, uh, she's an entrepreneur uh, <laughs> as well as an educator. She's the uh, co founder of Cyber Vista, uh, where she leads the development and delivery of cybersecurity training and education curriculum uh, to private sectors and governments around the world, um, helping to ensure that they have the people they need. Uh, to actually button up their security and respond to uh, cybersecurity threats. She was uh, previously a senior associate at Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, she has written extensively, taught extensively, and, and lectured uh, extensively on issues of how to prepare for the cyber threats of the future, uh, how to respond to cybersecurity adversaries, um, as well as how to you know, train uh, the people we need uh, uh, to, to ensure the success of our economy and our security going forward. Um, I've asked each one of them to speak for seven to 10 minutes uh, to, to leave some time for questions uh, from you, the audience here in Washington, DC, as well as those of you joining us online. Um, we're gonna start with Dr. Bartlett, who's going to give a broad overview about why 
uh, sort of the threshold question of why U.S.-Japan cooperation in cyber makes sense, why it's necessary, um, uh, Matsubara-san will uh, delve more deeply into the, uh, I think, very consequential uh, uh, changes in Japan's national security strategy and national security laws that were enacted just in the last few weeks. Um, uh, I was with Ambassador Rahm Emanuel in Tokyo in December. Um, he said without exaggeration uh, that he believed that the new uh, Japanese national security strategy and defense policies announced last year uh, and, and uh, reiterated by the prime minister during his visit to, to, to Washington, D.C. this week, um, are the most consequential uh, changes in Japan's defense posture um, since the Nakasone era in the mid-1990s. And perhaps even uh, uh, more dramatic than that, uh, but certainly the most consequential changes we've seen in the last 30 years. Um, and it's in response to a changing world uh, with a rising China, threats emerging from North Korea and other places. Um, and so she will delve into the implications of the new strategy of Japan uh, on the cybersecurity field. And finally, uh, 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 Simone will, will address the sort of how do we do it question. Uh, uh, what, what should we be doing to ensure that we have the people we need to work together, uh, uh, that they are adequately trained and that we exercise properly to be, uh, to be prepared for the, for the challenges that we face. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let me please invite uh, Dr. Bartlett to give his opening remarks, and then we'll move right down the panel and take your questions. So Benjamin, thank you. The floor is yours. Great. Well, again, thank you all for coming, and thank the man too for uh, letting us be here and talk about this important issue. Um, so as Frank said, I'm going to talk mainly about why um, the U.S. and Japan should be cooperating on this issue. Um, obviously, I don't think I have to sell too much that, that we need people to work in cybersecurity, right? There's about, uh, I think, 3.4 million workers needed in the world, about 410,000 in the U.S., I think about 56,000 in Japan, right? So we have these numbers, we can see the deficit. Um, but there's a question of, okay, well, that's fine, like we need more workers, but why the U.S. and Japan specifically? Like, why should that combination be working on this? Mm -hmm. um, and I think particularly beyond, I don't think I have to sell like why the military needs to be cooperating in this. Like, why why should the U.S. military and the Japan Self Defense Forces be cooperating in this? Right, that's an easy sell. But why should like the larger society uh, be working with this? Like, why is this an issue we care about in the first place? Um, and aside from the fact that we just like Japan here, um, I want to argue there's sort of three reasons. Uh, one sort of many hands make light work. Two, um, that, you know, even as advanced as cybersecurity has gotten, and, you know, for all the technical aspects of it, um, sort of trust in human networks still really, really matter. Mm -hmm. And three, um, going along with the theme I've heard a lot about in DC this week, actually, uh, diversity strengthens cybersecurity. So let me start first with sort of this idea of many hands make light work, right? Um, I've just talked about we have this huge demand uh, for workers, right? And if we want to build this as rapidly and as inexpensively as we can, right, sort of the more we can build economies of scale around the cybersecurity workforce, the better off we are, right? The cheaper we can make this, the easier we can make this, the more interchangeable in some sense we can make these workers, the better off. Um, and so if we sort of build these common training programs, if we build common syllabi, which actually is one of the recommendations the Mansfield is putting out in this report, um, it allows us to sort of pool our resources together. Um, and also, so, you know, US can be, and Japan can be bringing sort of people together to sort of come up with these syllabi and not repeat each other's work, right? So it's not like the US is making this syllabus and Japan is making this other syllabus. And not only that, right, they're teaching different things. So workers from Japan can't work in the US and vice versa, right? Instead, now we have this common pool across both countries. Um, now, of course, that's true regardless of which partner we're talking about, right? I mean, it would be good for, in general, to have more a, a more globally common workforce. But I think one nice thing is that, in a lot of ways, Japan is already paying attention to what the US is doing uh, in really useful ways. So in, in fact, uh, and TT and other companies, and I'm sure Miho can tell you more about this, has worked together um, to have worked together to build the syllabus, a common syllabus for a cybersecurity workforce in several different uh, positions. But they did so by looking at the NICE framework, which was created by the US government. Um, 
And so you already have Japan kind of learning from what the U.S. is doing and incorporating that. And now if we could just get the U.S. to be looking back at, we got sort of half of the equation, right? If we get the other half going, all right, that's only half as much work for us. Um, and we also right, have a very good relationship already between the U.S. and Japan, right, that we can build upon. So they, they're already sort of natural partners in this, really, in this regard. Um, second, this idea of trust in networks. So there's this great um, book called The Cuckoo's Egg, written about the Morris worm, right, way back in the day, right? Very, well, it's not actually about the Morris worm, it's about something else, but the end of it had the Morris worm. Um, and this Morris worm was, it was this uh, guy at MIT, it was actually, I think, the son of the NSA director at the time or something, uh, which is a little embarrassing, but um, who released this, were the very first worm out of the world, right? And it was just this little program that went to different computers and it, you know, essentially overwhelmed the, these computers. And how this got fixed, right? There's no... This very early on, right? There were no formal mechanisms at the time. So what was happening with system image were calling each other up. You know, the guy in MIT knew the guy at Stanford, et cetera, et cetera. And they were saying, hey, are you seeing this? How are you dealing with this? How do you fix this? Um, now, cybersecurity has advanced a lot, right? We have many more, um, you know, actual organizations and technical systems. But like, I just want to imagine two scenarios, right? Like one, you've got like Natasha working at, you know, Google security and, she sees this, you know, some sort of new security threat, some sort of new virus, and she says to herself, oh, I've got, I know I've got this document where I'm supposed to, like, call JP in CC in Japan and, and tell them about this and, and, you know, so on and so forth. Or second scenario, where Natasha knows her friend Yuriko at JP right, in Japan, and thinks to herself, oh, I'm seeing this thing, maybe I should, you know, give my friend Yuriko a call and tell her about this. Which of these do you think is more likely to actually end up with a call to JP Sir that gets listened to, right? Um, and so having this kind of interchange where people actually know each other, where you have these networks, where you know who to call on the other end, really make information sharing and other aspects of cybersecurity and, and sort of thinking about how to, thinking together about how to resolve these threats, much, much, much easier. I mean, again, right, this is another Mansfield recommendation where we talk about how by, in part, by building these common syllabi and through other methods, we can actually make it easier for each side to study abroad or to do joint training right? so that you have these opportunities for people in Japan and in the U.S. who are working in cybersecurity uh, to meet each other and to sort of build all those relationships ahead of time. We've also talked a little bit in that about seconding to other governments so it can go even beyond that, that sort of initial stages. Um, finally, in terms of diversity, right? So this is, again, has been a major theme this week. I keep hearing from various government officials uh, about how, you know, we're trying to build diversity, the advantages of diversity. I think the uh, most memorable example uh, came from the State Department, so thank you, State Department, um, where they talked about, although they were talking about the military, a mistake the military had made, so there you go, that's how bureaucracy <laughs> works sometimes, um, where, right, the military had gone and uh, built this well in this village in Afghanistan, uh, but because they were essentially no women on the team in the military and no, they hadn't thought to talk to any women in the village. And of course, women were the ones who actually would use the well. So they cited the well in the totally wrong place and none of the women used it, right? Um, so this is a good example of why you want to have diverse viewpoints. And of course, we want lots of women in cybersecurity too. So this is a, this is a great panel where, uh, but um, we also, it's really good to have a diversity of viewpoints from, you know, different countries as well, right? Um, where people come from very different thought patterns have different institutions, different mindsets, see the problem in different ways, can propose different solutions. Um, and not only right, in terms of the technical aspects, but also in terms of how do we train people to be cyber, you know, good cybersecurity workers, right? I mean, again, this thing from NTT and all these you know, Japanese companies coming together to build this common sy syllabus, right? I don't think American companies would have thought of that, but it's a good idea, right? Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but, um, but right, and that's like the sort of I, you know, we can learn from each other on sort of how we can, uh, you know, best train people and try different things and sort of come together with sort of better best practices. Um, and again, sort of on the why Japan question, right? You're talking about with the U.S. and Japan, you're talking about two countries, right, with very different uh, mindsets, histories, institutions, approaches to things, but we really like each other. Right, and you don't get that like good combination solved. Right, we have really good relations. We really have a lot of you know trust between those things. And so you've got these very different ways of approaching things, um, but at the same time, the sort of trust and relationship you need to sort of take advantage of that diversity. So those are my three reasons why we should totally do this. Um, and I hope, yeah, you all will agree with me. Um, but I'm really looking forward to hearing 
how we should do these things. So oh. I heard it over the, you know, I, I got the easy part of this job. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Benjamin. Uh, you have uh, neatly summarized the rationale, um, and uh, I will uh, reflect upon the fact that Mike Mansfield famously remarked that the U.S.-Japan relationship was the most important bilateral relationship in the world, bar none, <laughs> um, and that, that that spirit also, I think, uh, uh, is is found throughout the, the rationale for cooperation with Japan and the security. Uh, Mihoko, uh, before I turn to you, I want to point out that uh, Benjamin used an acronym. And when I used to work for Senator Biden, he used to drive me uh, nuts if I used acronyms and didn't explain them. He said something about something was nice. Yeah. And he wasn't talking about it being good. He was talking about the national um, um, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, the national initiative for cybersecurity education. National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, NICE, uh, which is a framework that we use. Okay, Mehoko, over to you. Thank you. Um, so I, I'd like to build up on, if I may, uh, that uh, excellent view uh, provided by Benjamin to focus a little bit more on uh, national security and global security collaboration between Japan and the United States. So I think there are three specific incidents that really shaped Japan's view toward uh, doing better for cybersecurity and also to shape the, the three national security documents that was uh, released uh, recently. So the first one was the ransomware attacks on the Colonial Pipeline incident uh, in May 2021. And it taught us that even a cyber crime against a one company can lead into uh, economic security or national security crisis through the supply chain attack. Even though that cyber criminals are like, oh, this is for money, but this can end up with a uh, national security crisis. And the second one is the ongoing war in Ukraine. So what the kind of lessons we can learn from this? So it is that uh, our adversary can combine the kinetic and cyber attacks to launch uh, massive adversarial activities against our civilian critical infrastructure companies. And also, it shows us the importance of collaboration between the civilian agencies, but also military and also critical infrastructure companies so that we can respond to a uh, crisis uh, in a timely manner and in a proper manner uh, in a crisis. And the second one is how China reacted to Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan last August. Because China or, or Taiwan faced a combination of not only cyber attacks, but also disinformation campaign and also electromagnetic attacks in addition to the massive PLA or uh, the military drills surrounding um, uh, Taiwan. So it told us we have to be prepared for multi-domain operations, not only just focusing on cybersecurity, but also across the domains. So how can we do that? So I think that is why uh, the national security documents that are released by the Japanese government recently is so timely and important for the alliance. And I sort of, also my background is Japanese Ministry of Defense, and I sort of it's revolutionary and also very significant for the Ministry of Defense and Self-Defense Forces actually declare that they will strengthen that not only the collaboration with uh, civilian agencies, but uh, international partners, but also critical infrastructure companies, because they had never said that upfront. And also, I was struck to see the world that an actually the national and uh, the Ministry of Defense and Self Defense Forces would help critical infrastructure companies uh, from cyber attacks in peacetime and also wartime. So it is also like, wow. So I, I think that this showcase you know, how much, how many lessons the Japanese uh, are learning from the ongoing war in Ukraine and also the, the the recent uh, development uh, in the Taiwan Strait. And also, because think about it, um, so it is really difficult to predict now what kind of cyber crime will evolve into 
economic security or national security crisis beforehand. So it totally makes sense for us, not only for Japan, but also for the United States to develop a really good collaborations and also build trust uh, through like, regular communications and uh, exercises and information sharing between not only uh, military or self-defense forces, but also civilian agencies, critical infrastructure companies, and also international partners in peacetime. Because you don't want to get surprised at, oh, we actually don't know whom to call to <laughs> in a crisis. So I'm really glad to see that the Japanese government and also self-defense forces and Ministry of Defense saw the urgent need to develop within Japan, but also that we need to develop that um, cross-domain capabilities in collaboration with the closest ally, the United States, because cyber attacks are borderless. And it can also, the, 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 the damage caused by any cyber attack can spread through uh, supply chain as showcased by a uh, ransom attack on the, uh, the colonial pipeline. So, um, so I'm so proud to say that now NTT, uh, my company has recently joined the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, uh, JCDC, uh, this January. Uh, so this is an uh, U.S. Uh, framework uh, launched by the, the Cybersecurity and uh, Infrastructure Security Agency under the Department of Homeland Security to unify our uh, global cyber defenders, but also to share cyber threat intelligence. And I think that uh, this is not only about one specific company. This is this showcases and uh, demonstrates you know, how much the Japanese uh, global industries is committed to contribute to global cybersecurity, but also global resiliency from collective wisdom. So they're working closely with you know, uh, international partners uh, from like-minded countries. So I'm so proud to see that, and I hope that this will develop uh, even further. And, but we have to do more too. So this kind of new development would require uh, information assurance and to share uh, sensitive information in a safe and secure manner between the government and industry, not within just in Japan, but also between Japan and the United States. So that is why I personally believe that the expansion of our security clearance systems to, to cover the Japanese industry is inevitable. Oh, of course, Japan already has security clearance system, but mostly only for the defense community. But again, <laughs> we cannot predict what kind of cyber crime will develop, in, develop uh, evolve into economic security or national security crisis beforehand. So that is why we have to give security clearance systems to non-traditional defense community people like critical infrastructure companies so ideally, I sort of it's really welcoming and refreshing and to see that the Japanese and American foreign and defense ministers acknowledge the importance of cybersecurity and also information assurance during the recent two plus two uh, meeting um, uh, in Washington DC here in Washington. And also, I, I think that uh, Japan and the United States in the right direction are moving forward. Why? Because we already have uh, conducted um, uh, joint exercises to, to, to have a more trust and also information sharing. So the self-defense forces and US forces uh, actually conducted uh, annual King Sword and Yamasakura exercises between uh, November uh, and December uh, 2022 to test multi-domain operational capabilities, uh, not only cyber, but also space. So it will cement not only our alliance, but also on how to communicate each other across the domains. But I think that now we need to do more because I haven't seen any media or press releases that actually this, uh, these uh, exercises invited any uh, industry mm -hmm. participants. So why mm -hmm. I should say that? Because, so for example, uh, Taiwan hosts an annual joint exercise uh, called Han Kwan uh, on every spring. And 
at least uh, as far as I can tell from uh, open sources, uh, the Taiwanese military invites critical infrastructure companies to Hong Kong uh, military exercise. Why? Because as we have seen uh, in the tragic uh, war in Ukraine, if anything happens, then they would attack uh, critical infrastructure companies. So it makes sense that we have already a trust and communications and also how we can react and uh, to, uh, uh, respond to that, that kind of crisis in collaboration between the government, military, and uh, 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 critical infrastructure companies. So we should learn from that. And I'm so excited to see that uh, Prime Minister Kishida is visiting Washington, D.C. in a, such a critical and also um, timely manner today to, because I'm sure that now he will uh, talk about uh, cybersecurity, as Frank said, and uh, uh, an incise um, event today. And this would, because if that kind of comments comes from the, the leader, the, the top leadership and from one company, one country, then it will strengthen and also accelerate our efforts to not only to uh, improve our uh, collective cybersecurity capabilities, but also uh, it will strengthen the multi-domain operational capabilities because everything is almost digitized and we, we should realize how much our uh, daily, uh, daily lives, uh, business operations and national security capabilities have been digitized. So cybersecurity is the integral part of our economic security and also national security. So. I'm really grateful that our two leaders, uh, Prime Minister Kishida and also the uh, President Biden, and acknowledge the importance of the, not only the alliance but also the, the, the cybersecurity in this in a, in a difficult times. And uh, thank you, Mansfield, to, to, to host this uh, event to talk about uh, these really important issues and opportunities. Hmm. Hello, Thank you. Thank you so much. Both Mihoko and Benjamin have spoken to the high level of trust and uh, a connection between Japan and the U.S. Uh, this program itself is, is a function of that. Uh, uh, the, I want to thank the Embassy of Japan in, in uh, Washington, D.C. for supporting this program today. And I want to thank again the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo for supporting the cyber working group uh, and uh, that, that we assembled at Mansfield. Uh, which will be publishing its report on deepening cooperation and human capital development on cybersecurity uh, very soon. Uh, that program under the direction of uh, Julianne Dosher, program manager here at the Mansfield Foundation, had a public symposium in Tokyo uh, a couple months ago, with, including uh, members of this panel. So uh, I want to thank both the Embassy of Japan here in D.C. and the Embassy of Washington, uh, United States in Tokyo. Um, both of our first two speakers have also uh, uh, committed themselves to the idea that it's not enough to have just the leaders proclaim the importance, but we need the working level of connectivity. This is a message we also heard at the Mansfield Foundation directly from uh, DNI Avril Haines uh, when she gave a, a talk for us last fall, uh, where she spoke about the very trusting successful high-level dialogue she has with her counterparts in Japan, but she frankly uh, uh, said we need more on information assurance, we need more on, on uh, security clearance systems, we need more working level connectivity um, uh, between the U.S. and Japan. So I want to turn now to Simone, who's going to tell us a little bit about how we can develop those networks of people and links and, and, and training and common standards uh, uh, and, and uh, people uh, who can get the job done. Simone? Thank you, Frank. And thank you, everyone, for having us this afternoon and taking your time out to listen to this conversation. I, I want to start out by saying, um, on a personal note, I started my career in cybersecurity in the Department of Defense. And I think both Mihoko and Benjamin's comments actually perfectly highlight the reason why human capital and people are so important to economic and therefore national security. Mm -hmm. Because as this issue has evolved, as our national governments have become more digitized, as our companies mm -hmm. have become more interconnected and digitized, it has created a bigger attack surface over time. And we were already stretched thin when it was purely mm -hmm. a national security issue. And cybersecurity has emerged as a unique area where it has created soft spots in 
throughout the entire fabric mm -hmm. of our government or our governmental and economic ecosystems. Um, and so when you think about then where do people fit into that problem, I think that it's worth putting into context where we got when it comes to human capital and cybersecurity. Um, because cybersecurity did not start as a profession where people just went into cybersecurity. They started as information assurance professionals. They started as information technology professionals, putting these networks into place. And it turns out that as humans, we are flawed. We create holes. We create vulnerabilities. And then we trust that they will work and people will kind of allow us to have those vulnerabilities. And that's not the case when you're dealing in an adversarial system. Um, but as the, just, as the field has, has evolved over time, it has become incredibly multi, multidisciplinary in the sense that there's pretty much not an aspect of our work lives, our defense lives, that doesn't have a cybersecurity component to it. And I say that because you could be a cybersecurity professional, you could be an IT professional, you can be a policy expert, um, you could be in the legal department or HR, you are in marketing if you are in a company and you are dealing with data and sensitive information that if exploited in the right way could have much bigger ramifications that ultimately have a national security implication to it. Um, so I want to put that into context of just why it's so important ultimately in our national security construct. Um, but then it kind of goes to, well, where does that leave us? Because the reality of the situation is that this field has evolved at a pace that's outstripped our ability collectively, the US, Japan, and frankly, most developed countries in the world to create the talent that we need to fill all these roles. Um, and that's put us in a major dilemma. That's put the US in a dilemma, it's put the, the Japanese in a dilemma, it's put most of the world in a dilemma in the sense that employers, whether they are government employers, agency employers, or private sector employers, are essentially struggling to hire and identify the right talent. They cannot find the people who can actually fit the roles that they need as they're changing on a day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year basis. Then they're actually having difficulties training the staff that they have to do the roles that they need. And again, this is a function of a lot of the job requirements that are actually in existence today are ones that didn't exist in those forms or fashions five years ago, two years ago. And so that just sheer pace makes it very difficult to have a long view of growing talent when the job role is gonna change in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and then third, because when you're dealing with just a straight up supply and demand problem, which is what I am describing, you can't retain the talent because it's too easy to have them be poached or someone kind of moves to another job because they're getting an offer for more money. So NTT might steal talent from the Ministry of Defense is what you're saying. <laughs> they might. And I, I will talk about that in a minute because I think we have to embrace that reality. <laughs> um, you know, but it, it's also not, it's also a struggle for individuals and professionals who are aspiring to upskill, level up and aspirationally and in, in, in their ambitions move into the career. Um, and so we have this dichotomy where we have all of this demand, but we don't have the real infrastructure to allow individuals to find jobs despite some of the educational opportunities we've given them, despite some of the credentials that we ask for in the system. And many of them, once they get there, um, and this is something I've seen throughout the course of my 15 years um, in the field, is that there is really difficulty to find a progressive career path once you get into the field. So not only mm -hmm. how do you stay there, but then how do you find a way to continue to advance, which one would allow you to sort of have a path to, to having a sustainable and fulfilling career in that space. Um, it would be remiss if I didn't also mention that human capital, people, at the end of the day, are our organizations and our infrastructure's biggest expense. Your biggest operating expense is on salaries and people. Um, and so when organizations are putting together their cyber defense strategies, um, we often will talk about dedicated security strategies in particular around people, process, and technology. And for whatever cultural or historical reasons in cybersecurity and in the industry, we love to focus on technology. We like to focus on process and we sort of just it, maybe acknowledge we should do something with people. Um, and what's so incredible about the, the Mansfield Foundation's work and the focus on this issue is that people are ultimately at the crux. And if you do not have a plan to develop, but also essentially work share, mm -hmm. certain advocates of your talent, um, we're not going to successfully crack this problem because we don't have the luxury of waiting 20 years to take every single 
five-year-old that's going into kindergarten, train them only in cybersecurity and tech, and then hope that that somehow creates enough talent that we actually meet the demand that probably will not slow down anytime <laughs> since we get there. Um, so how do we do that? Like, what are some of the things to do? Well, just on a, on a very tactical level, um, we still need to invest in smart technologies. We still need to invest in smart processes. We have to figure out how to do more with less. That's never going to go away. But spending some concerted time in building out a people strategy, meaning what are you thinking around in really three key areas? And the first is, how do you know your team? So when I say, do you know the team? Do you know what work roles you need in an organization in order to actually accomplish what you need relative to cybersecurity? Mm -hmm. That means you need to know the job, you need to know the role, you need to know the skills that you want people who sit in it to actually have in order to successfully fill that role. And then you need to look at the people that you have. Do they actually meet those criteria? Do they have those competencies to be effective? How do you identify where they are skill-wise to help you get to where you need to go? I think one of the important things when it comes down to knowing your team is how can you do that in as measurable a way using metrics, using data to capture what people know and what you need in the organization to be able to identify where you need to actually fill with people, where can you maybe off outsource with technology or maybe use third-party vendors. Um, and then for those that you have, what is your plan and how do you prioritize the spend so that you can upskill or cross-skill the talent that you have. Because in many cases, right, money is, especially in something like cybersecurity, that's often viewed as a cost center. Um, the, the biggest thing that you can do is potentially upskill internal talent that doesn't necessarily come with the premium of what a cybersecurity person who comes from a, another um, part of the industry might. The second is to know where you're going. So you have your existing organization as it is today, but to be able to develop the skill and the role pathways between the roles that you have today and the ones that you want to get to tomorrow, including for the staff that are supporting those roles, help you develop not only initiatives for advancing the maturity of your organization cybersecurity, but also the maturity and the retention of the staff that you have. Um, and that involves everything from creating training opportunities, what are professional development, um, in-house or outsourced programs. It could be rotational programs, internships, um, job shares across different organizations, um, more apprenticeship-like programs. There's a whole host of ways that can creatively be combined to sort of do that. Um, but I think the real takeaway is to identify for your particular organization, what can you invest in? as opposed to that really meets your specific needs, as opposed to looking for the one size fits all, because you have to put it in the lens of like what your organization needs. Um, and then that third part is once you actually accomplish those two things, you have to know the latest. This is not a field that um, allows individuals to come in, learn a set of skills, and then sit and perform them for the rest of their careers. It's actually a constantly changing landscape that means that there is a need to stay up to date and current and all the, the news, the current events, the industry and where it's going. Um, and so to be able to invest and prioritize those things um, for those staff and for those companies and organizations is, is really paramount to sort of maintaining and continuing that maturity of those programs. Um, I think the, the overall, when you think about, at least when I think about where this sits in the um, opportunity with US and Japan to collaborate together is really, I view this as a collective action problem. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, more secure our industries are, the more secure our governments are, and the more people we have to support this, it fosters both economic security because of the innate interrelated nature of the two things and the cybersecurity and national security that goes along with it. And so with an ally like Japan, especially given that we are literally sitting on two sides of the globe, um, and, and there are a huge amount of benefits, by the way, that are conferred when you think about um, some of the people challenges we have. I think there's a collective action where we should encourage that people from NTT could be very successful in getting job experience going into the government. And that could be the Japanese government, it could be rotational programs into the US government, it could be back into US counterpart companies. The more that we actually see folks who are 
capable of getting experience in other organizations. It makes them smarter and more well-rounded. It makes the organizations they ultimately go back to better when they come back. Um, and it also gives that individual a career path that they would not have necessarily otherwise had. So it's an efficient use of pooling talent, um, which I recognize is maybe a slight change from the way that organizations think about talent today. Usually we want to hold on to them and we're not really willing to embrace the revolving door. But you know, if we're going to be in any city in the world that revolving door relates to, I think we're sitting in it. So, um, so I think we should just embrace the revolving door and kind of form action around it. Um, and I think that's where, when we think about collective action for partnerships, those can be at the university level. I know it's one of the recommendations um, in the Mansfield Foundation report um, to, to cross-pollinate talent and provide students from both from universities in both countries to be able to see how each country approaches those things. I think grounding in a common lexicon um, mm -hmm. that you know, building off of something like the NICE framework can allow us to have a common way to talk about these jobs because you cannot find you can't do collective action. You can't find common ground unless you're saying the same, you're talking the same language. And I don't mean a physical, like our actual like tongues language. I mean the actual definition of how we describe certain cybersecurity jobs. Um, that is a, a yeoman's effort on itself. Um, and I think using that kind of facilitated common understanding of where human capital will fit is really the starting point to have a lot of these conversations around where there could be some joint bilateral efforts. Thank you, Simone. Uh, brilliant. Um, you have led us to uh, a framework about how the two countries and the companies and the ministries of, of the defense um, can take stock of the cyber talent that they have, uh, assess whether it meets their needs, uh, and perhaps develop uh, plans to, to redress uh, deficiencies. And, and you've opened the door to the notion that one of the ways that the gaps can be met is through deepening uh, rotations, uh, sharing of talent, um, uh, and that the efficiencies that, that can arise from that. Um, we have several questions that have been posed already by speakers uh, online. And one of them, uh, Simone, your comments began to address, but the question was actually uh, directed to Mihoko, and I want to share it from Albert Lee. He asks, you know, what do you believe, Mihoko, is the biggest hurdle for Japan? in terms of recruiting and retaining the cyber talent that it does need. And, you know, Simone has, has uh, spoken to maybe part of the solution, uh, but, but when you look at the challenge for Japan, a country with a shrinking population, uh, a, a country that uh, uh, has not traditionally um, relied heavily on immigrant labor uh, in high-tech fields, Mm -hmm. um, um, how do you assess the, the biggest challenges for Japan in, in recruiting and retaining the cyber talent that it needs? Oh, thank you for the question. So I, I think that um, the Japanese tend to uh, define the cybersecurity talent uh, pool uh, more narrowly as uh, compared to Americans. So in the United States, cybersecurity workforce can be really diversified. It can be like uh, technical engineers and also um, like cybersecurity policy experts that sitting in Washington, D.C. think tanks, but also can be um, cyber threat intelligence analysts uh, sitting in uh, three letter agencies. So it can be really, really diversified pools of cybersecurity talents, whereas uh, I think that Japan is changing uh, slowly to embrace uh, diversified uh, cybersecurity uh, talent pools, but I think they tend to think only tend to only look at uh, cybersecurity technical people versus uh, diversified people. So I, I think that uh, to well to be fair, that uh, both of the countries are facing the massive deficit of cybersecurity talents, and we have to find out new ways to recruit um, uh, not only uh, youngsters, but also mid careers and more seasoned uh, 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 talents into this uh, workforce. So how can we do that? I, I think you know, the way Japan needs to develop is to, to talk to people who are interested in cybersecurity and uh, empowering them to, to by, by giving uh, opportunities to, to get trained because 
everybody in this room or online are using IT, right? Because we are using Zoom. So, so we are IT users. So we, we have to be uh, familiar with some sort of cybersecurity uh, basic um, actions to, to protect ourselves. So, so we are already like uh, some sort of cybersecurity users. And so, so how can we use in that kind of the background to, to take advantage of the, their natural interest mm -hmm. from their own backgrounds to, to make sure that if they are more interest uh, in developing cybersecurity career paths in the future, then we should give them the opportunities, maybe more technical skill sets or maybe more legal training or more, maybe or even like a marketing skill set are focusing more on cybersecurity. In that way, we can um, diversify our pools and also to, to increase the number of the future cybersecurity um, uh, talents. Mihoko, you've uh, given me hope as a history major that I, I may yet still have a future. You have to come up for the future, right? In all seriousness, uh, uh, you've opened my eyes to something that I think uh, Simone and Benjamin also uh, I'd like to ask a comment on. Uh, and there was a, a further question from a guy named John Alexander Sinman online. Um, I think we, I tend to think too narrowly about cybersecurity. I think about cybersecurity as only the domain of, of computer science graduates who are worried about malware or worms and, and addressing you know, computer hacking. Um, but I think Simone would, would agree with the idea that cybersecurity is also about workplace culture. It's also about, about public education. Uh, it's also about what each individual in an institution can do to ensure that they're not a weak link uh, uh, in, in a cybersecurity doctrine. Um, and the question that John had was sort of what are the training and certifications you know, that, that um, uh, young people should seek out if they want to ensure that they have a future uh, in the cybersecurity field? And, and so uh, could I ask Simone and Benjamin, maybe to, they're both uh, involved in education, can I ask you to speak to this? Uh, uh, it's not just computer science, is it? What, what are the other skill sets or, or degrees or certifications that you think that people should be pursuing if they want to have a future in this field? Uh, uh, Benjamin? I'll start because she can be able to answer the certifications <laughs> more better than I will be. So I'll talk more broadly. So I, I do think, and this follows up with Mio's point that, right, um, cybersecurity is not just about being a technical person, right? We need people who understand cybersecurity and law. We need people who can do threat intelligence and so have a really good understanding of sort of both sort of you know, how actors think in general sort of political science sense of things, but also knowing a lot about specific countries, right? If you can know a little bit about cybersecurity and know a bit about Russian, you can do really well for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the, the thing to think about is, is think more broadly about what it means to be mm -hmm. uh, involved in cybersecurity, right? It's not just about getting these technical certifications. There are all kinds of ways you can bring in other types of skills and really add value uh, to this field in a way that someone who's just purely technical, right, is just in some ways just another person who's really good at technical stuff. And we do need those, but right, but there are other ways of, where you might get a value added into this that um, that someone just doing a technical path might not. But. Yeah, um, I I say this in in actually the most complimentary way possible. It's like my biggest pet peeve mm -hmm. um, that we continue to try and recommend to individuals and our young people go get a certain degree or go get a particular credential because what we see is that there's a huge risk that they go get it they make a massive investment and then we have a cognitive dissonance on the industry side of our expectations of what we want for the talent it's very very common for companies and our own government to put out job requirements that say we want someone to have a CISSP certification that is prohibitive for any person entering the field because you cannot obtain that credential unless you have five years of experience. And so it becomes a, a catch-22. You can't get the first job because people don't want to hire you unless you have the five years. How are you going to get the five years if you haven't been able to get the job? Um, and so my recommendation across the board, first and foremost, is actually to, to kind of point the finger at ourselves on the industry side and say, we have to change our expectations and stop expecting that we're going to hire people who are coming in on day one, capable of doing the mm -hmm. job, and we have a greater responsibility to train them once they get there to make them job ready, and that the 
education that the credentials they should pursue are the ones that become more intangible and harder for us to train from a technical perspective, right? Like there is a push in the cybersecurity space in particular right now that it doesn't require a four-year college degree. That's entirely true. But what I think a lot of employers sometimes miss is, well, there are certain roles they like the four-year degree, not because of the technical skills that are conferred, but they want someone who understands how to work in teams. They want to have had the good writing experience and the communication, all those things that you get as a well-rounded undergraduate experience. And like that doesn't come across in the job description. And so people make that mistake. Um, so my recommendation to young folks, my long-winded way of saying this, is I think you have to think first about what about cybersecurity is what is most interesting to you? Because Ben, to your point and to Mihoko, is like, it's a pretty broad field, especially mm -hmm. as we define it here. If you like firefighting, go become an incident responder. That's going to be a very different skill set than someone who loves solving problems and wants to investigate. And they should go do cyber threat intel versus someone who likes law and where that all intersects. And they should potentially, like, you're going to be better finding a law like a law degree, yeah. and then finding how you can translate that into cybersecurity than the other way around. Great. And I think we need to embrace that. So follow your passion and and know that that there are many ways in which that field may ultimately intersect with cybersecurity and, and be applicable to the cybersecurity threats that we're facing. Great. I want to open to the floor. Uh, we have a, a few more minutes available for questions. Uh, Please, and just uh, identify yourself and, and uh, ask a question, please. Sure, thank you. I'm Phyllis Singer Vincent. I'm a former Mansfield alum from uh, the cohort, 25 cohort. I just got back from Japan. Welcome, oh, welcome. Uh, Thank you for this excellent programming. Wanted to open this question up to the, the entire panel. I was encouraged by Dr. Bartlett when you said, diversity strengthens cybersecurity. And much of that was done. Thank you so much for talking about um, uh, just opportunities perhaps in the end. But I think my question is all to everyone on the panel, but I wanted to specifically ask you about, you mentioned human capital, but I'm, I'm wondering if you could perhaps also speak to um, the opportunities for small businesses uh -huh. that are already perhaps established. I know oftentimes innovation tends to start with smaller companies and also typically um, oftentimes you also see um, diversity there um, as well. So maybe you could talk about opportunities, you know, what the focus might be for small businesses and how they may also, um, you know, make it known that they have perhaps a background that could readily fit into you know, the needs that are clearly here from both the United States and the mm -hmm. U.S. Who would like to try to pick on the small business role? in particular as an incubator um, or as a producer of talent and, and innovation? So I can talk about from uh, from, from uh, Japanese uh, experiences. Uh, so small and medium-sized companies, and uh, the importance of the, uh, the, the roles played by small and medium-sized companies are not overlooked uh, usually, because even though that is in small and medium-sized companies, pretty, such a big role in a global supply chain, but because they don't have money and they don't have human resources to spend on, so that's why they, they're like, ah, we are too small to be hacked, so we don't have to invest in cybersecurity, but that's a, such a wrong way to think about the current cyber threats, because if you are the, the weakest link, then you're going to be targeted heavily by our adversary. So there are uh, a couple of ways that you know, how the Japanese government and also industries to, to help the small and medium-sized companies to enhance their cyber defenses. So, so the, the first problem is money, right? So the Japanese government came up with this uh, well, firefighter <laughs> responding <laughs> type of uh, team up so that they launched the, the pilot programs to team up with a local IT cybersecurity companies, but also cyber insurance companies, and also the, the, maybe the local chamber of commerce to work together to take advantage of that already trusted uh, relationship between the small and medium-sized companies and local chamber of commerce to, to, to talk to the small and medium-sized companies to, to help them to identify any potential threats and if necessary, respond to uh, cyber attacks. 
And also, uh, because small and medium-sized companies are so overwhelmed, they understand the need of cybersecurity, but they are like, cybersecurity is so intimidating. They are so technical. I don't understand what the cyber attacks means to us. So that's why the Japanese uh, government uh, came up with a really Japanese way to address this issue, manga. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because cyber attacks, it is really difficult to understand the threats of cyber attacks because it's sometimes invisible, right? So if it is the threats are invisible, how you can understand that the need to address those threats? So that's why if you use manga, you have to visualize <laughs> what the problem is. So the Japanese uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Government started to issue uh, manga to talk about what kind of cyber threats are out there to target small and medium-sized companies and what kind of basic level of cybersecurity actions are you are expected to take. So at a reasonable cost, because you, you don't expect small and medium-sized companies to spend millions of dollars on cyber defenses. And also you have to have a trusted environment to talk about your problems and concerns so the big Japanese companies like uh, NTT and Hitachi or NEC uh, work with local chamber of commerce because lo local chamber of commerce already have a trusted uh, platforms to talk to a bunch of different issues, not only cybersecurity to talk to local uh, small and medium sized companies. So we host like uh, workshops, closed doors. So you can talk about anything related to cybersecurity and um, Cybersecurity experts from big companies can share like a reasonably priced, uh, not not selling, but all another talk about what kind of cybersecurity basic actions they are expected to take. So there, you, you have to take multi-layered level of an actions to take to to make sure that small and medium-sized companies have access to right resources. Thank you, Miho. Uh, with apologies to the audience, I want to take one more question online and, and maybe the final question. We're going to transition from micro to macro. Um, and uh, uh, board chairman Jerry Curtis of the Mansfield Foundation uh, poses a question for the panel. Um, he understands uh, the, the persuasiveness of the value of the bilateral cooperation U.S.-Japan, but he asks a, a macro question about um, uh, multilateral cooperation in cyber. Um, and uh, where that should be headed, um, and whether the national security laws uh, recently adopted by Japan uh, have applicability not only to sort of deepening U.S.-Japan bilateral cooperation in cyber and space and other areas, uh, but open the door or, or how they may impact uh, multilateral cooperation, specifically with the Republic of Korea, which is another uh, mm -hmm. like-minded treaty ally of the United States of the region, uh, that shares many of the security and economic concerns uh, that the U.S. and Japan share. Uh, so if I can ask uh, the panel to try to address the issues about the limits of bilateral cooperation mm -hmm. and the benefits of multilateral cooperation and, and how we might uh, think about the bilateral cooperation we have with Japan as a kind of a, a norm setting uh, uh, standard setting exercise that could be expanded or, or be a platform to, to expand multilateral cooperation in the cyber security field. I know it's a big question. We don't have much time to address it, uh, but who would like to take a, a stab at that? Uh, Benjamin, you want to start? No, uh, no uh, you know, uh, more is better. Uh, good American that I am, I would like, like many Americans here in D.C. would love to see Japan and South Korea and the U.S. all uh, working together on this issue. Uh, the same problems that make U.S. and, uh, sorry, not U.S., U.S. is fun, that make South Korean and Japanese cooperation uh, difficult on other issues, uh, make it difficult on this issue. Um, I do think one advantage of cybersecurity is that cooperation doesn't necessarily have to be at the government level, right? So this is a place where, you know, Japanese and South Korean firms or Japanese and South Korean universities, right, could get together and start working on, on these things, right? Um, and so I think that actually is a potential for cooperation where we don't have, this doesn't have to be top down, this can be bottom up, which I do think, you know, there's more opportunity there to sort of overcome some of these difficulties if you're not instantly going to the government level. Um, so I do think there are 
opportunities here. But I think I think that's going to at least for the near term be the way to get it done. Right? Thank you, Ben. And Miho, does the national security changes in Japan have implications for multilateral cooperation? I think so. Yeah, because look, uh, cyber threats can come from anywhere in the world, and of course, now you have to have a trust to share sensitive information because you don't want to talk about your vulnerabilities to anybody in the world. You only want to talk. You only want to have that kind of conversation with trusted partners. But so, it's always better to start small. But you can always build upon the, the, the framework of initiatives to, to bring in different voices and different partners. So I think it makes sense yeah, because no, no, that, yeah, because three countries are not already a democratic and not shared valued uh, countries. So we should definitely share more cyber security information and help each other for better cyber defenses. Thank you, Miho. And uh, to use for the final word, Simone, uh, throwing in one more question from online from Todd Sanders. Uh, uh, he asks, you know, we've got companies out there uh, that may have resources or expertise in this field that are not yet able to play for any number of reasons in terms of, of barriers set up by governments or institutions that make it hard for them to bring their talent to, to the problem. Uh, if you could, you know, we're talking here about throwing open the door potentially to other national partners, but but what, what can we do to, to cultivate a, a cybersecurity environment that is more open and inclusive? Yeah, well, it's, it's funny because when I think about the limitations of any bilateral relationship, it ultimately comes down to trust and information sharing. Um, and we have a few models where we have been able to overcome those in other areas. Like within the intelligence community, we have the five eyes. There is a specific component of who we've identified as allies that we are willing to share that information with. It takes some work um, to sort of establish what are the parameters that you feel like you can work on some of that trust. Um, but I think that you have to start there at, under, at like identifying what are the underlying principles that you're going to kind of hold someone as we're friends, we're allies, we're partners. Now let's actually start to, to share information. I think you have if you don't do that at the foundational level, it becomes impossible to kind of build it overall. Uh, well, look, uh, we've reached the end of a, a really scintillating hour of discussion uh, on U.S.-Japan co cooperation in cyber. I want to thank all three of our presenters. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. The, uh, the genius of the Mansfield Foundation is that we don't have the best uh, people who work here. We know how to attract the best people to come and help us out with their brain power. <laughs> Uh, no, we have we have good folks too, uh, but but we, but we really rely on the the genius of uh, the experts who were able to bring in to to help us address the the critical problems. Uh, our Mansfield Fellows Network, almost two hundred strong, uh, uh, who have worked in Japan and come back to Washington to populate the U.S. government with expertise about Japan across many fields. Uh, our corporate friends who who bring their private sector ideas and innovation and support to the foundation. Um, uh, and then all of the stakeholders and institutional partners of the foundation. Uh, we are a people-focused institution um, uh, today discussing a people-focused uh, technical challenge. Uh, I thank you for joining this discussion. I thank those who joined online. Uh, please look forward to future Mansfield Foundation events. Uh, we will publish soon our report on U.S.-Japan cooperation on developing the cybersecurity workforce of the future that we need. Um, uh, and we look forward to joining with you here in Washington or, or via Zoom, um, as long as it doesn't get hacked um, <laughs> at, at, at future events. Thank you so much. Sorry, got the good time out.